Hello and welcome to House Lights Go, a podcast discussing the absence of live concerts and gigs caused by the COVID crisis. Join me, John Ashworth, a roadie of 20 years experience, to find out what live shows mean to some of the world's leading musicians, performers, technicians and artists. The guest on the first ever episode of House Lights Go is Frank Turner. Frank has played over 2,500 live shows at venues ranging from his friend Rachel's front room to the 2012 London Olympic opening ceremony. He has recently recorded over 45 live stream shows and he joins us now via Squadcast. Ah. Hello, mate. How are you doing? I'm all right, thanks. How are you? Very good, thanks. Very good. Look at that. I was on time and everything. A very punctual. In fact, I think you were literally to the second. I know. Well, Surprise. punctual but not punk, maybe, but fuck it. Here we are. <laughs> How are you doing? I see you've been doing a few of these uh, Zoom things. I, I, I have got quite used to talking to people on uh, in this format at this point in my life. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm all right. I mean, you know, like everybody, it's a, been a shit year, but, yeah. um, uh, you know, uh, it, it, could, I, it could be worse. I could have more to complain about. So um, I'll shut up. Um, how are you? Good. Yeah. It's been a fairly dramatic change mm. as well. I can imagine. Driving my van around the street, the uh, streets of Dorset. Delivering groceries. Oh right, okay, yeah, you got into that world. My, um, there was a moment uh, towards the end of last year when like half my crew and like a bunch of Paloma Faith crew were manning a vac- uh, testing center in Liverpool, and in the most roady thing ever, they like they rearranged the the traffic flow um, oh, really? through the uh, <laughs> through the center. They, they they arrived all and were like, no, 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 yeah. no, this isn't going to work, and just started. <laughs> um, like so, yeah, just started rearranging. So I thought it was fucking hilarious, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's been a strange, it's been a strange year. Okay, it makes sense to try and discuss how you normally would go through between playing live, writing and recording, and then going out again to re- to play live some yeah. new material. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there is a traditional record cycle in the industry, um, as I'm sure you're aware, um, mm. uh, which is which can feel a bit like a treadmill on occasion, um, although. You know, at the end of the day, this this is as well as being my passion and my calling and all that kind of thing. It is also my job, so it's not um, something I'm going to complain about too much, especially now. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, you know, I, um, I'll have a set of songs written, and the, in between existing touring schedules, um, recording sessions get arranged and producers get picked and that kind of thing. And that's for me too, because I tour a lot. That's been a process that generally gets slotted into gaps of a touring schedule that's already going on. And, you know, new songs will start arriving in set lists and you try them out and see whether everybody hates your new direction or whatever. Um, and then uh, yeah, you do your recording, there's the mixing process, there's there's this the inbuilt kind of delay process in the music industry between finishing writing a song and actually people being able to listen to a recorded version of it, it can be several years, which is um, occasionally a little frustrating because... Um, it doesn't feel super spontaneous, but it, it is what it is. And there's good reasons for it. Namely, you want to kind of present your best face. Do you know what I mean? Your best version of a song, your best recording of it, and kind yeah. of have a campaign to put it together properly. And a huge part of that campaign will be touring. So, you know, you head off and you do your shows, and then hopefully you've got a big festival season planned as well, and that will be a big part of the um, of the plot and all the rest of it. And, and for me, as a, as a kind of mid-level rock artist, for want of a better description like touring's absolutely fundamental not only in terms of the promotion of what i do in the sense that you know getting in front of people um getting in front of your own fan base for a tour um getting in front of other people's fan base for support tours getting in front of as many people as you can on the festival circuit you know that's how you let people know that you still exist that you have new things to say um and that please go and listen to my album or whatever but also you know financially i make the vast majority of my living from touring um, and my crew make them a hundred percent of their income from my touring. Um, and, uh, my band make 99% of their income from my touring. Um, <laughs> and you know, so it's, it's, it's absolutely central to everything. It helps for me personally, that it's also philosophically at the heart of what I do. And I grew up listening to black flag and I've always wanted to be a hard touring road dog and all that kind of business. But like, you know, even if I didn't, feel particularly good about that i would probably still be doing a similar tour schedule because that's how i pay my rent so you alluded to it earlier that you you sort of do the b-level shows will you have that next album sort of written at that point uh generally speaking yeah i mean i 
I, I, I don't want to do any places down. Actually, it's worth throwing in that some t- quite often what we I do as far as the UK goes is that I quite consciously will do an A market tour and a B market tour. And actually, um, the B market tour part of it is is amazing because you play places that other bands don't go, and that's more interesting and more fun for me and my band and my crew. Um, and it makes more of an impact in a funny way. Like people who live in Manchester can go and see many many shows, and that's great. But like if you then go and play Scunthorpe. People in Scunthorpe come to the show and go, no one ever plays here. Um, And people used to. That's the other thing. If you look at tour schedules from the 70s and the 80s, people did. And and, and no one does anymore, or at least not many people do. And, like, we've had some of our best ever shows in, like, Wakefield and Bridport and places like this. And and, and it's really, really fun. Actually, last year, um, just before lockdown, I played a show in Boston. The UK Boston um, at this incredible Boston venue, Lincoln, yeah. yeah, Boston Lincolnshire. This absolutely amazing venue that had a bingo hall attached to it that used to be the kind of place where the Beatles and um, you know those kinds of people would play. Oh, wow. um, and no one's played. Very few people have played there in the last couple of decades. And I went through, and it was one of the best shows ever, pretty much. Anyway, um, yeah, generally speaking, I mean, you know, songwriting is an, uh, an elusive thing, and it, it comes along, and 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 every time around, it's I've got slightly different targets I'm trying to hit, and. You know, I've yeah. made records which have been very collaborative with my band, and I've made records which have been very, um, you know, closely guarded creatively by me. And and they, it will change each time depending on uh, all those kinds of things. But generally speaking, yeah, by the time you're kind of um, towards the end of an album cycle, I have most of a new record cooking at the very least in my head. And in some occasions, as I mentioned earlier, I'll be playing some of that stuff live as well. Yeah. So you, yeah, you do play live. That a lot of bands I've worked with don't do that. It's like just never play a brand new untested song, which is interesting. Although uh, probably more back in the old days, people used to. Yeah, I mean, I can understand. Well, I actually had a very interesting um, experience with this. And uh, I'm going to try and say this without sounding like I'm throwing shade, I think is the expression on anybody else. But like, um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a commonly known thing among artists that one thing that quite often happens with everything apart from your debut album is that you write a song and you record a song and then you go out and play it live and in the first month of playing it live, it changes quite a lot because you actually figure the song out a bit better in an audience context, which with your debut album you have time to do because you're, you haven't been signed and you're just playing the songs and they kind of come together in an interesting way and there is an argument to be made that that's one of the reasons why a lot of debut records sound more exciting is because they've been played in a lot more in the live context. And I was thinking, this was in 2013, 14, I was thinking about how to try and kind of cheat that process for what would become my sixth record. So as we were touring album five, which was called Take That Heart, which was a very, very long international tour, um, I was writing the new material and then I was rehearsing with the band and we built... Um, a self-contained audio system. So we had, we were carrying mics and cables and in-ear monitors and cat five and splits and all the rest of it. So that every day we didn't really need to sound check in the sense of like kick drum, please. Um, you know what I mean? It was, it was in theory, yeah, yeah. it was ready straight to in. go. Yeah. Straight in once the crew had finished building. And that meant that we spent two hours every single show day for about two and a half years rehearsing what would be the following record. Um, and then, um, playing those songs live every night we play one or two of them and um th- this was a, a consciously des- devised plan that i'd come up with and one of the things for me was that like i um a lot of people's kind of reticence about that is a lot to do with modern technology with camera phones and people videoing it and putting it on youtube a half formed version of a song or whatever and yeah. and i mean even without that specific concern there are bands who will do that i think slightly grim thing of putting you know like no camera for no camera phones no videoing signs around the venue and like i've even encountered bands like doing bag searches for cameras which i think is an awful look personally um anyway so um and i thought about this and you know what i did and it worked a hundred percent i just asked nicely (laughs) every night i'd go listen guys we're gonna play a new song it's not finished uh it's not been recorded do us a favor don't video it and put it on the internet. You can video the rest of it, I don't give a shit, but like, just leave this one out for now. And we did that for several hundred shows all around the world, and not one new song got uploaded onto YouTube. Do you think that's something to do with your... I mean, your shows are quite interactive, and you speak to the crowd a lot. And that that's probably has a lot to do with it. The crowd are involved, aren't they? So, so yeah. they're, um, yes. they're, they're doing you a favour <laughs> in a way as well. Yeah, 
by by sort of road letting you allowing you to road test new material yeah completely and i think that you know as a fan myself if i see a band it, i don't want to hear i mean it's rare that that many people want to hear a band play like eight new songs in a row or whatever, but like it can yeah, be pretty yeah, cool yeah. if you're watching a band, if you structure the set list appropriately and you do that thing where you bookend the new one with two like bangers <laughs> yeah. um, so yeah. that, you know, people's energy levels will coast from one to the other. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, it, this gets ideological for a second, just in the sense that like, one of the things I always loved about punk rock as a concept was the idea that it wasn't about two different classes of people meeting on either side of a barrier um, where the kind of higher caste would deign to, and to, you know, to, to be in the presence of the kind of the yeah. trolls or whatever the fuck that, that whole thing I've always found kind of grim and punk to me was always about a meeting of equals. And I loved the thing that the early kind of hardcore shows I went to growing up, the people in the bands would all be in the audience before their set and after their set. And it's just their time on stage was their go, you know, sometimes during. Yeah. And, 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 and I, and I love that. And, and I, and I, you know, I try and kind of maintain some sort of vibe of that of like, sure. When I'm on stage prancing about and playing my guitar and shouting and all the rest of it, fine, pay attention. But it's like, it's not a permanent state of affairs that I'm on a raised piece of flooring. It's just for an hour and an hour and a half yeah. or whatever. Do you find that different shows sort of affect that if you're up on stage at Reading main stage when you're about 60 feet away from the nearest fan? That must be a bit of a challenge. Absolutely. And I mean, I think a thing, a thing I noticed a long time ago, but wish I'd had learned even earlier than that was that like, you know, a, a lot of people are aware that like musicianship and songwriting are two separate skills and they are like, there are, terrible musicians who write great songs and vice versa but there's a third string to this which is that performance is a skill as well from the point from my point of view and it is a, it's a whole other skill set that you can concentrate on and i remember just kind of noticing i mean i think it's true that anybody in a band in a touring band who's ever going to get anywhere if they see any other band be at the headline of their opening for or their own support band or whatever they are at least on some level taking notes do you know what i mean it's like interesting um you know and like i think one of the things i noticed very early on in my touring career thankfully when my old band million dead we opened for pitch shifter and js Clayton, their singer who's an amazing front man He just kind of walked on the stage and it was like it was his house and it just you knew it was his house you were in his house suddenly and it was like his gaff his rules and there was not in an aggressive or shitty way it was just he owned the stage and the whole room the minute he walked on and it was a, it's about projection it's about confidence and that's a thing and you know that being comfortable in his skin in that environment and um, I remember on the first night of that tour, that was my first ever tour playing to more than like a hundred people ever. Um, and, uh, you know, I did the first show, like we did all the shows we did in punk squats where I would sing at my feet and then the kick drum for a bit. And then maybe the ceiling fan <laughs> and the other guys in million Deb were just like, you should sing at the crowd, <laughs> you know, they bought tickets and they're over there. So look at them. And I was like, oh, well, look at them. There's fucking loads of them. <laughs> um, and, they, and they were just like, no, no, they, they are the focus here. Of the, They are the point of the exercise. And I started, it took me many years, but like I learned over time that you've got it. You, the point, the thing you're trying to do is create a connection and to communicate and to engage people. And at the very least, you should look at them while, <laughs> while you're trying to do that. Well, I suppose that, uh, this has all gone away now, though, this this owning yes. of the room because there's no way of doing it into a webcam is there do you think there's no there's no response i know people can sort of yeah no it is it. very very different i mean i think one of the things i noticed in because i started doing live stream shows pretty much straight away and part of the reason for that was that i was on tour with my wife and my friends vanessa and micah from ohio and like we had to cancel the end of the tour and we all went back to my house in london and uh it was like well we're all here <laughs> we might as well do the show we were going to do tonight anyway, just to the computer. But I think one of the things I realized I noticed is how reliant on the audience some of my kind of stage and well, my performance tricks were just little kind of breaks for a cheer or, you know, the old classic of you sing it um, or whatever it might be. 
and you, you do that to your laptop yeah. and nothing happens. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a degree to which as a performer that you're surfing the energy of the room and your job is you're a kind of, you're almost like a pump who's trying to keep that energy circulating between the, the, the stage and the audience and around the room and just trying to make sure, you know, that it doesn't fall stagnant and, and it doesn't kind of ebb away and all the rest of it. And, um, there's no way of doing that uh, in a live stream context. And, you know, it is still a bit weird to me to finish a song and not much. I mean, my wife claps and that's great. Um, uh, my cat generally gives me a sour look and stalks <laughs> out of the room. Um, and I, I suppose, I mean, I'm getting used to it. I've done an awful lot of live stream shows, but it's just, it, it is weird. It is different. Um, yeah. and actually last summer when I did do a handful of like, um, socially distant shows where there was a real audience, the most emotional part of it for me was hearing a proper round of applause. Um, and I know that makes me sound terribly shallow <laughs> or, or <laughs> egomaniacal or whatever, but it was amazing. And the, the first song of the night, I finished the song and, and there was noise in the room and it was just like, fuck like it was it was quite something yeah and I, I've, I've actually watched back one of your shows it's a38 rocks does that ring any bells 2016 yeah that's that was in budapest yeah yeah you're right in the middle of it and i actually yeah. it's um photosynthesis i was looking at and you do the, the sort of sitting down because mm. friends can ask friends to do weird shit and with that in mind, I'd like to see everybody in here taking a seat on the ground right now. I'm not kidding. I'm serious. I want to see you take a seat. Let's do this. It, it's so different from, from not necessarily our other live shows, but from what we have going on now. And you talk about community. Yeah. In your in, in your speech, and it, but it's just, it's just. I'm like, I hate to admit it. I actually felt a little bit tearful because I was like, that would have been cool to yeah. be there, and now no one can be there. No one can do that. Yes. Yeah. So, so it's like a huge hole in, in live music or in music, really. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, one silver lining to the enormous cloud, a very small silver lining to the enormous cloud that we're living under, is that I feel that the whole business of live streaming has very, very precisely focused in attention in on what is special about live music. Because arguably speaking, particularly if you're talking about like larger arena shows or whatever, like there's someone playing they're playing now you are listening you can hear it what's different then why is it not the same and the reason it's not the same is because you're not gathering together in 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 this physical way not just with the artist but with the other audience members as well do you know what i mean and that sort of feeling yeah. of coming together and and becoming more than the sum of your parts and and of of creating something that didn't exist before um i, I think is really really powerful and, and you know, I've, I've always sort of had a suspicion that that was the case, but I feel now like I have much better vocabulary to, to, to verbalize what it is is special and different about a live performance. And streaming is not the same. And there's a lot of people right now who I think are betting the farm on streaming being an integral part of live music forever. And I think that there's a lot of people going to lose said farms on that because, um, you know, the second that I don't have to live stream anymore, I'm really not sure how much more of it I'm going to do because it isn't what I do. Do you know what I mean? It's not what yeah. I signed up for and it's not the same. And you don't get that kind of sense of transcendence. And, and I guess one of the other things as well for me is that like, one of the things I've always loved about touring is that it's ephemeral. It's not a recorded format. And you know, what's so exciting to me about the show is that it happened once it happened there in that room with that audience and that band and that PA and all the rest of it. And if you weren't there, tough shit go to another gig on the t tour or see the band again but it's just it's like you know if you weren't in the room for you know whatever it might be nirvana at reading 92 or, or slain springsteen at slain castle or whatever if you weren't there then you weren't there there's nothing you can do about it and that's what makes it exciting buying a ticket in the first place that's what makes it exciting being there is there's this really it's like a this snowflake thing being created and it exists once and then it's gone you know um and and i cannot wait to get back to that um that sense that something magic is happening and it's happening now and it's not going to happen again yeah, absolutely. I can I can see you're you're doing a live stream tonight, and I saw in your tweet mm. that you're doing some new material. <clears throat> so that makes me think. Yes. Obviously, live shows are totally missing. But then, what's now? Mm. If it were a typical touring cycle, you'd be writing and recording. 
Oh, actually, you yeah. said you'd actually be touring right now, but you've now got this extended break, which is a break that you would have never have had this long. So do you think the songs are going to mm. be mi- millions of versions of the same song before you settle down on one? Or <laughs> um, you're going to release an interim, no, an EP, I, or what, you know, that sort of thing? Um, well, we'll see in terms of releases. I mean, the thing that's happened for me, but when at the start of this year, I was maybe 10 songs into writing another record and I tend to write about 15 for an album and then you pick 12 and you've got three B-sides and everybody's happy. And so, yeah, in, in, in February 2020, I was thinking to myself, cool, I need to write another four or five songs and, and we're good. And then lockdown happened. And it's a funny thing because like a, a lot of people, myself included at the beginning, were kind of like, well, at the very least, here's an extended period with no distractions where I can be purely creative, um, which was actually bollocks because there was one enormous distraction, which was the unprecedented global pandemic, which it yeah. turns out could be quite distracting um, and certainly gave rise to the lockdown song, which is a genre that I think is going to get very, very tiring very quickly and of, of which I'm extremely guilty of writing many of. And I, th- I feel like everyone's allowed... Everyone's allowed one, you know what I mean? Like, but it's going to be the difficult I'm post-lockdown sure. album, isn't it? Instead of the difficult second album, right, and that, the second album after lockdown. <laughs> yeah, I just sort of feel like, a, you know, in a year's time, if we are out the other side of this, I'm not sure how much people are going to want to listen to songs about April 2020 and how shit everything was. It's going to be like, don't remind us, we were there. Yeah. Um, so... But anyway, but so I, but basically, so I, I went from 10 songs then. At this point now, I think I've finished 26, um, which is a lot for me. And some are better than others, let's be honest. But that, that's always the case. And I guess um, yeah. I am actually now in a place where I, when restrictions were a little easier last year, I managed to record about two-thirds of the record. Um, oh, okay. It was an interesting process. We were doing it remotely. Our producer was in Vermont, and we were in Oxford. Um, and he had like a live stream of what we were tracking and was commenting on it. And, but we were recording it in Oxford, obviously, and then uploading the data to him overnight. And I'd, I had kind of expected that to be kind of a difficult way of working. And it was actually not. It was fucking amazing because um, it was very focused. We couldn't spend, we couldn't decide to spend half, an eight, half a day fanning about with guitar amps. And, and <laughs> do you know what I mean? It was just like, get it sounding good. Um, but yeah, so and then we broke for Christmas, and we were all like, "Well, we'll pick that up again in January." Yeah. And then, um, but uh, but even that, I mean, we are tracking fourteen songs, but like my 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 um, reservoir to draw from for the of material for this record has ended up being much much bigger than it would otherwise have been, and I would say that the at least half the record has been written since lockdown started. They're not all lockdown songs. Don't worry. But like, do you know what I mean? There's like, there's it's, and, and, uh, and I'm quite, um, it's going to, I think basically what I'm saying is I think it's going to end up being a much better record than it was otherwise going to be because I've had more time to focus on it. And maybe there's a lesson in there for me. I should have spent more time on previous albums, but whatever. Um, it, yeah, it just, it, it feels pretty good. Um, I'm excited about it. Yeah, it's, it's sort of an interesting interesting gap. I'd imagine there'll be some people who have, have just gone to do something totally different, start recording videos yeah. or making podcasts and, and things like that. Because if you've got yeah. an album in mind, and then what, do you, what are you supposed to do? Do you feel like you're writing songs, not essentially for nothing, but with no particular focus? Well, you just, just that- keep churning out new material that isn't based on your album or yeah, that that's a that's a good question because obviously, I mean, one of the things I observe quite closely, partly because they're friends of mine, and partly because I feel like we operate in reasonably similar circles. With I was watching Biffy dealing with the fact that they had a record. I think it was supposed to come out in like April 2020, and you know, we've all seemed to have forgotten now how the lockdown was supposed to last three and a half weeks or something at the beginning. So they initially went it'll be right um and and then uh and obviously you know at that kind of distance they were already into the album campaign they were already geeing it up doing pre-orders whatever it might be and with a touring schedule books and all the rest of it they ended up putting it out in the middle of last year and just doing this and i mean like hats off to them they did this like gargantuan amount of virtual promo for it if you know what i mean and they were i've never drowned in facebook adverts for something so hard in my life and and um i kind of felt sorry for them in many ways they kind of had to proceed because they'd already said they were gonna. But you know, for me, as I was saying earlier, and I think for Biffy as well, touring is such an integral part of the promotional cycle for a record that um, 
you know, it was it was kind of agonizing watching them trying their very best to deal with it. And yeah. I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a f- phenomenal record. It's their best in years, and and you know, I'm sure it's done as well as could be expected. But it would have done better if there wasn't a pandemic going on. And I and I feel for them, I really do. And so for myself, like I'm in this place where it's like. I, I've kind of said that I don't really want to release this record until I can tour it in some shape or form. Thankfully, like, I mean, I think it's unlikely to be finished until the back end of this year anyway, in terms of finishing the tracking and the mixing and mastering and artwork and all that kind of shit. So hopefully that'll work out. But I, I'm kind of of a mind that I'd almost rather push it back so that I can tour it properly. Yeah, that's interesting. That's because I- if you're Biffy and you've obviously they made the album, it, it kind of makes sense to release it on the original schedule to me because yeah. you then, as we talked about, there's a record cycle. And if you don't release it, then you're going to start causing more problems <laughs> than, than you solve, if you know what I mean. I mean yeah. You're either going to start releasing right. two records in a year and then touring for three years. Or I, I, I don't know. Logistically, it just seems to make yeah. sense to, to get it out there. It's it's very difficult and it's uncharted territory and I think that nobody really quite knows yeah. what the right thing to do and all of this is, um, but and, and so I guess we'll see. But like you know, not least because actually for for me right now the thing that I'm thinking about a lot is the fact that the new record that I'm two thirds away through making is um, very much like an aggressive punk rock record which I wish to tour with my band yeah. um, and yeah. to play in crammed sweaty rooms um across the world you know what i mean with bodies flying and all the rest of it and like i don't want to have to try and do that virtually do you know what i mean no <laughs> virtual mosh pit smash up your own yeah. front room um so that sounds exciting with the lockdown it seems ideal to come out with a sort of punky record to go back to that sort of sweaty visceral show i have a theory that this summer in the uk is going to be very punk um, and I don't necessarily mean musically. I just mean that, you know, it is a tragedy that Glastonbury's got cancelled. I love Glastonbury. I'm not saying anything bad about Glastonbury, but it's a bit like, you know, just because okay. the biggest player in the room got cancelled, there's a lot of people acting that that means there'll be no live music this summer. And I'm just like, what the fuck are you talking about? And I have plans vaguely coming together to essentially just like get in a van and drive around and play, obviously within distancing confines and all the rest of it, but just play it anywhere like play squats and play fields and play pub car parks and shit and just you know kind of go back to what live music is supposed to be you know which is like something really visceral and really kind of like see of its pants and i just i habitually in terms of my character and in terms of my kind of outlook on the world i'm quite a big fan of chaos and of things being out at like not regimented anyway and like i could just sort of see things getting a bit kind of like wild in a way that i think is kind of exciting um so yeah and, and, and i guess the thing that i would say within that is that what i'm trying to do is be as kind of like flexible and responsive as possibly can so it's just like i, I want to be ready to just get in my car and drive and do a gig like at a moment's notice if it's possible again obviously in a safe way yeah. i'm not fucking smash mouth um but like <laughs> you know uh I, I just to 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 make the most of the situation you know, which I think is the thing is a thing that the people who work who work in the live music industry are very good at doing anyway. And it's just like fuck it, okay, I can't play Glastonbury. That sucks. Let's find a field nearby where we can get five hundred people socially distanced and play there instead. Um, and just you know, don't like focus on the negatives and just just find a way through. And I'm excited about that. I think that that's exciting for next year's festivals. I think there will be festivals next summer. I mean, mm, hopefully. Yeah. But we do have, as I say, we do have that light at the end of the tunnel. And I really wonder what they're going to be like. I mean, what do you think they're going to be like? What do you think the crowd's going to be like? I mean, they're going to be full of energy, aren't they? I think, or not? Or do you think they'll be a bit scared? I think, well, that's my only, my my concern. It's very easy to paint a picture in which there's just this joyous release of everyone hugging and all the rest of it. Mm. But there's a, there's a concern yeah. in that image for me, which is that, like I can see people who are nervous about going suddenly getting hugged and going like, fuck this and, and kind of getting panicky about it. And like in, in all honesty, like, you know, the idea right now of being in the middle of a pit for a punk show makes me kind of a little bit wary if nothing else. You know what I mean? It's like, really? Um, and like, I think it will take a minute 
or two to for people to relax about that and, and i guess i can sort of see that there might be conflict between because there's definitely people out there who don't give a fuck about lockdown uh, and i'm not yeah. necessarily only talking about anti-vaxxers and all that those idiots but like you know there's kind of i feel like there's a lot of younger people who for whatever reason and arguably understandably are like fuck this noise i want to go and party and i can just sort of see a potential clash between that kind of person and the kind of person who's like, oh, I really don't know if I should go to this, but I'm going to risk it kind of thing. And then they show up and a bunch of pissed up lads push them into the middle of a mosh pit and it's a disaster. So, <laughs> and, and in enough. fact, yeah. I feel yeah, like as, as a performer, I will almost certainly have to figure out some sort of wording to address that from the stage as and when that is possible again. Um, but I mean, it's, it's difficult to say because I think that there will be some kind of staged return. I think there will be socially distant shows and then slightly less socially distant shows. And I think that at some point, yes, there will be a mosh pit again. But like, I just hope that collectively as an industry and as fans and all the rest of it, we're able to figure out a way of getting back there that's considerate. Do you know what I mean? That isn't just kind of like, right, it's fine now, yeah. down the front. And, and um <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm worrying too much about it, but that does kind of cross my mind. Maybe. I mean, but you, but the crowds sort of separate themselves out, don't they? I mean, you can imagine the people who don't care will be right down the front and squeezed in. Yeah. Well, I say that there'll be there'll be mega fans who 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 want to be down the front, but will be a bit scared. But you do always get that natural you do. across the crowd as it makes its way back towards the room to the. Bar. Yeah, you do, you do, and I, I suspect, I, I guess, yeah. There's just there might it might be smart, let's say, for performers and crew and the people who are in, yeah. in charge of presenting the show consider those kinds of things. Do you know what I mean? Um, and just try and you know figure out a way of making sure that everybody feels welcome and included and all that kind of thing and it isn't yeah. just this kind of like darwinistic kind of struggle um down at the front you know it's the indoor ones isn't it i think i think the festivals the big outdoor festivals will feel quite nice because you can remove yourself from any situation you can, yeah you might not enjoy the show as much as you would if you were crammed in but at least you're feeling comfortable with your environment right and one thing i would say from my experience of the socially distance shows i did over the summer and this won't last forever but like for example i did one of those shows in newcastle where they had um on the on the race ground they had like a, a stage set up in a field and bubbles and it was very kind of uh regimented and it, it was quite sort of nervous generally no one was quite sure what the fuck was going on and in the run-up to the show i was thinking to myself is this going to be awful i don't know like what what are we doing here and then it was super weird but it was e all the weirdness was easily outweighed by the sheer joy of just being at a gig for punters and performers and everybody it was just like it's a fucking gig and like you know once the sun went down it was freezing because we were in the northeast but like once sun that sun went down you almost didn't notice and it was just great and it and th there was this outpouring of joy that it was live music of any kind. So I do think that there is a kind of like, um, that's something to perhaps think about and take advantage of, of like, you know, we could, um, uh, I think people will be more forgiving of weirdnesses, let's say, is what yeah. I'm trying to say, you know, for a little while, they'll be kind of like, you know, yes, yes, you have to do this weird shit, but in return, you get to go to gig and everyone will go, that's fine. Um, I was going to ask you about something that you'd seen live from another band that is, that made you want to do your show the way you do. You, you mentioned it earlier with your with pitch shifter. Yeah. I was thinking probably before that, even before you were in million dead, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, definitely. Or is that going too far? No, I mean, um, funnily enough, actually, this is going to get quite obscurantist for five seconds. Forgive me that. But like, um, somebody set up a new Instagram account called UKHC in the nineties or something like that. And I used to be, okay. well, I used to be an attendee at a lot of UK hardcore shows in the nineties. And like, there was a photo of me, the gawky, awful teenage me in the crowd watching a band called Knuckle Dust, who I love. They were kind of like my black flag, you know, as in I, I got I, who I actually got to see play live. They're a fucking phenomenal band. They are still going, um, but I, I saw them a lot in the late nineties. And yeah, did you see them? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I can remember um, sort of running away really when Pierre would come down and start doing his fly kick routine. <laughs> <laughs> Been like this, going to really hurt if I get in the way of that. So I'm standing back. But yeah, definitely at the garage. Right. It was that photo from the garage? I, d I did see it. I it was, yeah, it was. Yeah, I, it could, I could have um, been to that show. I don't think I ever saw them headline, though. They would have been supporting somebody. Well, that was it was part of a, an all day festival, like Evil Fest or something like that. Um, yeah, or, I, I, I think it was called. I think that show was. 
Yeah, that show was Spring Slapdown. I looked it up. It was called the Spring <laughs> Slapdown. Slapdown. Yeah. I can remember getting my jaw dislocated to stamping ground at the Kingston Peel. <laughs> Wow, you know, I hadn't realised that you and I must have been at many of the same shows in that case. Yeah, I, I think so. I, yeah, yeah, I saw Stamp Ground all the time back then. I can remember one, one of my favourite gigs at the garages was, I'm missing Dropkick Murphys, supported by Agnostic Front. Wow. I, funnily enough, the first ever hardcore show I went to was in 1997, and it was Agnostic Front at the garage. Um, and I'd not really encountered, I was into metal and I was into punk and somebody told me, well, if you're into those two, there's this music that's sort of half and half and you'll be bang into it. And I was like, okay. Um, and of course, this being pre the internet, I hadn't listened to anything before the show because where the fuck would you find an agnostic front record in Winchester in 1997? Yeah. Um, so I just kind of went down to the show and it, they fucking tore my head off. Um, it was a pretty life changing experience for me. They were so good. Yeah, and I, I, it's a bit like chasing the dragon, isn't it? I, you sort of go and see all these hardcore bands that you've never heard before because it might be like it might be a bit like that, you know. Yeah. I remember going to see Twenty Five <laughs> to Life upstairs at the garage. It, it didn't I've, quite hit the spot like that, did? But I remember. Sitting, I remember sitting, I'm pretty sure cool. I was at that show. I'm pretty sure I was at that show. I'm Twenty Five to Life upstairs at the garage. Yeah. Supported by a band called Racial We're Abuse. Abuse. Oh my god, no, no, yeah, yeah. Racial Abuse became Cameron, of whom I was briefly a member. Oh, really? Um, Racial Abuse, yeah, it was two guys from Austria. Well, and George uh, from Cameron now lives in Vienna and is still a very dear friend of mine. Um, but Aaron um, and I can't remember the drummer's name, they were they the drummer was super young when he was yeah, in Racial yeah, yeah. Abuse. Um, they then the, and the, 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 obviously the band name was supposed to be against racial abuse, but yeah, um, yeah. it was crossed through when written spoken. down, but spoken Not, didn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. No, it wasn't a brilliant kind of marketing move on their part, but, um, they, they uh, um, yeah, they formed Cameron, um, Cameron toured with knee jerk, my old band a long yeah. time ago. Um, and then Cameron briefly relocated to the UK uh, to sort of set up in London because they felt that Vienna wasn't going to be a thing. And I played bass in Cameron for um, about a month. Um, <laughs> and then I can't even really remember what happened. It didn't work out. And um, uh, But yeah, they, they, were, they, were, they were amazing. I was aiming to wrap up the conversation by asking you your favourite song to play live. Not necessarily your biggest hit, but one that is always uh, goes on the set list to uh, get the crowd going. That's the magic. Um, I, I've got a song um, called Four Simple Words. To be honest, was slightly written for the live context. It's got it opens with a kind of um, sort of acoustic ballady kind of vibe. It then goes into some like a heavy punk section, um, and then uh, it then there's a waltz break, and then there's another punk section. And it was, I mean, I, I like it as a song, and I'll stand by it. All the rest of it, but it's definitely was written with quite a big eye on the crowd, and it's sort of. It, it, it's the finisher. It sort of has to, if we play it, it has to go last um, because it's just this kind of yeah. raucous explosion. And over time, it's evolved. Death songs do live in such a way that I've actually stopped playing guitar in it. So I get rid of my guitar, grab the mic, and get full agnostic front um, uh, on the on the mic. And, <laughs> and then and, and it, the, all these little things have kind of evolved. About I'll generally go for a jog around the venue, um, and I quite often end up having a little dance in the waltz section with with someone in the middle of the crowd, and then a crowd crowd surf and blah 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 and um it's you know it's like it's definitely become a bit of a performance piece over time i have to say but it is just a blast yeah. and i mean there's, there's been nights over the years where it's been a bit like oh i've got to do that again which i always feel is a bad feeling as a performer because it's there is supposed to be at least a degree of spontaneity to what you're doing um but uh nevertheless it's like i mean right now i'd swap an arm to be able to do that again right now i i almost threw away everything I wanted to write when I read your Facebook post. Oh, right. Yeah. Last night. <laughs> where you're reminiscing. It actually really conjured up some memories in my mind. And I, and I really identified with, with a lot of it, that sort of build up mm. 
slow build up. We're, we're actually at the beginning. You do your sound check. It feels boring after that. And then all of a sudden it, it rises and rises. And then all of a sudden it's action stations. Yeah. It's like a fuse, a fuse, a fuse gets lit at the start of the day and, and burns slowly and fizzes a bit more in sound check. And then suddenly it explodes. And yeah, I mean, I, I wrote that Facebook post cause I was yeah. having a glum day, shall we say, um, about, uh, there is definitely a feeling that I have about I feel quite – in life, I try and avoid special pleading, right? I try and avoid the idea that, like, my situation is, is particularly special and noteworthy because that's almost certainly – that's almost always not true. But, like, I do feel like the live industry has been hit almost harder than anything else by this pandemic. It really has. Like, our job usually is to gather large groups of people together in confined spaces – and that is specifically yeah. a thing that we cannot do. It's exactly what we're not supposed to do. Yeah, and and I just sort of feel yeah. like, um, you know, I, I just I was I, I used the word in the post. I used the word grieving. I just feel like I'm grieving. I, I, I was chatting to another friend of mine, songwriter friend of mine, um, just this morning, and he was sort of saying, you know, it just feels like a dream I had once. Um, and he and I have toured the world together, and it's just it's a. It's. It, I, don't, I don't want to end this on negative no, no, no. note, but it can be fucking miserable, man. It's just. It's like we used to do that. Do you know what I mean? That's and like I see footage of myself playing Reading Festival or, or the O2 Arena or something, and, and I'm kind of like, who the fuck is that? Um, because I haven't done it for quite yeah. a long time now, and um, I worry about whether I can remember how to do it. Um, you know, I'm sure it's, or at least I hope it's like riding a bike and it will come back and all the rest. But like. You know, it's it's been a it's been a difficult fucking year. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it does feel like a bit of a somber note to finish on. Frank, thank you for coming on the first of our house lights go. It's been it's been an absolute pleasure. I've I've, I've, this, I've really enjoyed this. So very twenty first century. You're probably listening to me on some kind of portable stereo. That was it for the first ever House Lights Go. Thank you very much for listening. The next episode features Barry Burns from Mogwai. You can keep up to date with House Lights Go on Twitter at House Lights underscore Go, Instagram at House Lights Go, and there is a video version of this episode on the House Lights Go YouTube channel. Thank you very much. We'll see you guys again. Good night.